T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Flight control, we have no confirmed. In the late 1970s, my family moved from an older part of the Denver suburb of Lakewood to a newer area where everything was just a little farther apart. My parents had busy careers, so I often had to walk where I needed to go. I walked for what felt like an hour to get to my elementary school and home every day, and sometimes I did have to walk for an hour or more to get home from wherever I had been dropped off. I walked alongside lanes of commuter traffic, two, sometimes four lanes of cars moving at 35 to 50 miles per hour, and I got the distinct sense that I just didn't belong there. Not only was I usually the only child out walking, I was usually the only person out walking. We had sidewalks, but those streets were made for cars, and honestly, I couldn't wait until I could learn to drive and belong there too. Now, learning how to fend for myself in that environment did have the desired effect my parents were after. It made me independent, resilient, and resourceful. I did figure out how to get just about everywhere I needed to go on my own two feet. It was just a lonely and isolating experience. I did learn how to use the bus when it worked for where I needed to go. And that whole experience just made me intensely curious about and sensitive to the kinds of places where walking and bicycling were easier, more comfortable, and where human bodies actually belonged. Since then, the Denver area has just continued to sprawl outward, even as our walkable and well-connected city centers have infilled and attracted new residents. We've just kept expanding our highways. Cars and trucks are getting bigger and more powerful. And people trying to negotiate busy streets on foot, on bikes, or in wheelchairs are getting hit and dying in ever greater numbers. All of this has had a big impact on the environment as well. Transportation accounts for the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States every year, 28%. More than half of that comes from our everyday trips. And according to the US Department of Transportation, we only take about 12% of our daily trips by walking and bicycling now. That represents a massive shift over the past 100 years that has been disastrous for our physical health, our mental health, our social connectedness, and for the health of the planet. At the same time that we've kept moving farther away from each other in busy metro areas, we've also been sold the idea that it's our individual responsibility to solve climate change by driving less. It was actually oil giant BP, British Petroleum, that popularized the notion of the carbon footprint starting in 2004 to distract us from the really big polluters and the systems that enrich them. Some people do take the responsibility for our growing dependence on fossil fuels very personally. A man named John Francis witnessed an oil spill in the San Francisco Bay in 1971, and he was so affected by that that he spent the next 22 years walking in protest. Can you imagine doing that? Not getting into any kind of a vehicle for 22 years? Probably not, because most people now live in the kinds of places like where I grew up, where different land uses are in very different places, supported by a system of transportation that makes us dependent on one mode, driving. In so many ways, transportation is more about the relationship between people and places than it is about the infrastructure itself. It's about where we are and where we're going, of course, but it's also about what's convenient and close by and the power dynamics that are embedded in those relationships. When I had to slog home alongside four lanes of fast-moving traffic in the suburb where I grew up, I received the message loud and clear. 
that walking and bicycling were for recreation, not for transportation. Now, recreation is important for our health, of course, but if we're ever going to trade polluting trips for people-powered trips, then walking, bicycling, and taking public transit have to be the easiest, most comfortable, and most efficient ways to get where we're going. Now, this concept of comfort is important. Comfort is a big part of belonging. You can tell whose comfort is being accommodated by the rules and expectations that are enforced in any given er area, especially in streets. We've seen that very clearly this year, but it's been documented for a long time. Three years ago, journalists in Jacksonville, Florida, investigated a phenomenon they called walking while black. They found that black pedestrians were three times more likely to be ticketed for jaywalking than white pedestrians, and that residents of the lowest income areas of the city were six times more likely to receive citations than residents of the other, part of the, other parts of the city. Now those low income areas of Jacksonville and other cities like Denver are places that have been torn apart by highways and fast-moving traffic on arterial roads, separating housing from shopping areas, schools, and other important destinations. There are places where polluting industries are common, where it can be dangerous just to be outside, and where public transportation may not work very well if it's available at all. Ticketing people for violating car-centric rules in the streets that they have to deal with does nothing to make pedestrians safer or crashes less likely. It only reinforces the racism and discrimination that undergird enforcement and the entire transportation system. To truly rebuild relationships between people and places and to reduce our collective transportation emissions, we have to be willing to shift our focus away from prioritizing traffic flow to centering authentic and equitable community engagement that puts decision makers in direct relationship with people who have been harmed and marginalized by the existing transportation systems. So that their needs for comfort and belonging can truly be served, which actually makes everybody's lives better, makes the environments for everyone better. All that walking I did as a young person led me to a career in urban planning and research focused on what makes places better for people. And I use walking as a community engagement method. Doing that, I've learned so much about what people value, but also about what makes things difficult, what makes it difficult for people to use walking, bicycling, and taking public transit, what we call active trips. For example, for a lot of older adults, walking on what looks like a lovely off-street network of multi-use paths can be really scary because bicyclists come whizzing by at high speeds. Children love to play in drainage ditches and run down alleyways and generally be outdoors. But when it comes to walking and bicycling to school, both children and their parents can really resist that because crosswalks are a terrifying no man's land where drivers behave unpredictably. That leads parents to drive their children to school more often, compounding the problem. People who rely on wheelchairs and other mobility devices often lose their independence in the wintertime in Colorado because snow plows come along and push snow and ice into the curb cuts that provide access to transportation. True story, one of the members of my city's pedestrian action committee who uses a wheelchair missed at least two meetings this winter that were focused on learning from people with disabilities because he could not get to his bus stop. The way was blocked by snow and ice. People's lives are complicated. People's choices are complicated. And we all hold fears that keep polluting inequitable and unjust systems in place. We have gotten used to cars and trucks as our instant transportation on demand. And until we truly invest in broad networks of clean, safe, efficient, and affordable public transportation that actually goes where people need it to go when they need to get there, 
cars will continue to bridge those gaps. The question is, how do we make those gaps smaller and make active trips, walking, bicycling, and taking public transit, the easiest and most enjoyable ways to get where we're going? Well, if transportation is more about relationships than infrastructure, then we need to approach that question as we would any good relationship. We need to be willing to listen, to get creative and try things out, and to care about the people around us. For those of us in the transportation field, that means putting down the standards manuals and the plans and actually going outside and experiencing places with the people we serve. One of the transportation planners I work with, after we had walked for a couple of years with people from all around our city, she said to me, I'm not afraid of community engagement anymore. And that was so meaningful to me because it confirmed that our typical top-down processes of shaping our environments just doesn't work. It puts decision makers on the defensive and leaves people out of the process. If walking, bicycling, and taking public transit are ever going to truly impact our transportation emissions, then we cannot be afraid of each other. We cannot be afraid to really work together and collaborate to remake our transportation systems for activity and for belonging. Now, at the highest level, that means subsidizing streets for people and public transportation, not highways and SUVs as we do now. At the local level, that means really committing to that grassroots community engagement that amplifies the voices of people typically left out of those processes. And at the personal level, it means electing local leaders who care about walking, bicycling, and taking public transit, who use those modes themselves, and holding them to those commitments. And it also means reflecting on our own habits and behaviors, learning why it's difficult for us to take active trips, taking notes on that, and taking those notes to our decision makers, committing to being part of the process. If we're all part of the movement to make places in our transportation systems better for people, we will make a big difference for ourselves, for our communities, and for the planet. In the immortal words of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. Thank you.